server, writing editor in Elixir. So just how am I planning to bore you? I'm um, going to talk about why I would do this, sort of the design that I went through. Yes? Mike, a little closer. Is that better? Should I just speak louder? I'll try speaking louder. OK. So how am I planning to bore you? Why do this? Why? Uh, I'm going to talk about the design of an editor, uh, the UI pieces I went through, some tips I learned along the way. Um, when I started this, I had this like, big ambition that I was going to come here with this awesome editor to show you and all these things I did. Uh, and it's very much going to be more like a progress report. So I'll just tell you kind of uh, the, what I thought was going to be easy and how it ended up being hard and kind of like how I've worked around it in the meantime. Um, and so one of the questions may be, why, why, why do this? Like, why would you bother writing another editor? There's so many around. Um, I've just always had a fascination with them. Um, and so I'm just going to talk to you about that. So um, I'm just going to get on with it. Uh, you've got to sit here for 45 minutes, you can leave, whatever. Um, so my story, well, the details of my life are quite inconsequential. Um, initial release, 1974. Um, I've been a computer user since 1979, so core gamer, core gamer dude. Um, five years old, I was doing B-load Space Invaders, where you press play on the tape and you wait 10 minutes, and then you can type B-run Space Invaders, and then you get to play Space Invaders. So I've been coding for a while. It's 1982, 10 print, 20 go to 10. I've probably wrote that program 100 times. Um, I think there's a few bugs in it still. Um, <clears throat> uh, but more important than that, I've been editing since 1993. Uh, that's when I met my first love, Emacs. Um, and I don't have a future roadmap uh, right now, no destination on Node. So I thought, hey, why not write an editor? Because we need more of those. So before you start doing that, you might think, OK, I'm going to embark on this project. What, what would make an editor successful? Um, we should probably reflect on that a bit. Uh, why do some come and go and others persist? Uh, why do neckbeards cling to 1970s tech? <laughs> uh, why do hipsters insist on editing through 20 layers of abstraction? You know, these are things worth pondering. Um, so in the beginning, there was Ed. And everyone knows that Ed is the standard text editor. <laughs> and it's actually still the best on a teletype. So try using, it, try using a Electra or an Atom on one of those. Um, VI was created, uh, oh, missed one here. Oh, I missed a slide. Um, I was going to say Emacs was created in 1976. Uh, VI was also created in 1976 and had a pretty important update, Vim, in 1991, which, you know, there's this whole religious war between Emacs and Vim. Um, there's sort of some offshoots there, like Smalltalk has this kind of really powerful editing environment, which is kind of tied into all the different objects, and you can do things like search on, uh, give me all the methods that take a string and return a list which uh, is pretty useful. Um, and then we kind of got into the GUI area uh, in the 90s. <laughs> um, you had these giant monstrosities like IntelliJ and Eclipse and NetBeans. And I remember sitting there for hours, hours of my day, thinking, I'm getting paid to sit here and watch this thing uh, garbage collect, <laughs> which you know, I didn't mind. There's an XKCD cartoon, you know, compiling. That's, that's exactly what it was about. Um, but I, you know, I, I really didn't like those, and I would find ways to hack it so I could do my coding in Emacs, and then I would pop over to this thing, it would notice the file change, it would compile. Uh, mostly because I just didn't like editing through a tiny little people. Um, and then you kind of have the, the modern editors. And those are things like TextMate, um, Sublime, Atom. <laughs> that was actually said yesterday. I, I laughed out loud. I thought it was awesome. Um, I'm going somewhere with this, so don't, don't get offended yet. Uh, and if somebody could tell me what's wrong with my Atom, I would really appreciate it, because I start it up, and I get all these red boxes, and then like the inspector shows up, and I try clicking around, and it won't do anything except crash. Um, and the whole point with that is it's just supposed to be easy. It's supposed to work. So I don't, like, if I'm going to use Atom instead of Emacs or Vim, I don't want to spend time making it work. Um, now some of this may have offended you. Um, and that's an important clue. And it's because, as programmers, we often have a deep personal relationship with our editor. Uh, we've often spent much more time with it than with our wife, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Um, and it's really about power and productivity. And sometimes there's a delicate balance there. Um, and I really think that's the answer to kind of what makes a good, a good editor. Um, it's what it allows you to uh, really get into a flow. It allows you to kind of be one with the computer and like you're having thoughts and they're coming out and you're bouncing around and you're getting stuff done really quickly. And you can you can do that in an editor that you're really comfortable with and that's really powerful, and you switch to another one where even someone just moved the keys around, and it's just utter frustration. So these things are really important to us. So again, why do this? Um, well, my hypothesis is that the reason that Emacs is so powerful is that, uh, and there's so, 
like for me, and that maybe for others too, the reason there's such an attachment to it is that you can do so many things without leaving it, you can actually write Emacs in Emacs. So you can sit there and say, I want this feature, pop over to a buffer, type some code, hit reload, and now you have that feature. Um, that's just kind of mind-bending when you first discover that. Um, and like to my knowledge, like you, you can like edit like the a couple of things in Vim, you can kind of like do some start stuff like that, um, like reload the config. Uh, I don't know, I'm not as familiar with them. Maybe you can do that kind of deep level customization, maybe not, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, and, and I do love Emacs, but things have been rough lately. Um, I, I, I sit around and I see things like Atom and it can do all these kind of really cool, awesome features. I'm like, oh, it'd be nice to have, that's why I try it, it blows up on my desktop. Or, um, you know, Vim has all these nice plugins and they're kind of working good and they're getting updates and they have a plugin system. And, you know, I kind of look at some of those things like, oh, I'd like to have some of those. Um, and I, I try doing that at Emacs and I, I end up spending a lot of time making it work and figuring out, okay, they've, they've finally updated like the version of the graphics library is that now everything breaks and then updated package, everything breaks. Um, it's just the code has gotten to a point where it's just layered and layered and it's just hell to work with. Um, and for me, maybe it's a syntax thing. Like, I like Lisp, the idea, and I like doing lots of little small snippets with it, but I don't know if you've ever looked at like Elisp code inside Emacs. It'll be like 30 lines with like 12 lines deep and it's just impenetrable. I can't figure out how to change it. And as a hacker, I want to write my own. I want to have control over my environment. Um, and that was the whole, kind of the whole reason for me to kind of get into this. And now we have this great language that is simultaneously perfect and a terrible choice for doing this. <laughs> um, it's great because it's high level, it's easy to develop in, it's great for orchestration, we've got the durability of OTP, and we've got code reloading. Um, and it's terrible because the GUI ecosystem is pretty limited. Uh, it just hasn't been Erlang or Elixir strength, and I have arrows in my back to prove this. And pioneers are the ones that get arrows in their back. But we can fix this, and I really like the concept of inventing on principle, or in this case, I'm just shamelessly stealing lots of ideas and re-implementing them in a new language, but that's okay. So Elixir has this nice correspondence. Um, you know, Emacs has a C core uh, with what my project, which I call Emacs. Um, I can do a Rust core, and I can tie it in, and I can have a lot of safety. Um, they have Elas Elisp, we have Elixir. I've heard, I, I don't know if it's true, if it's apocryphal, but I heard once that uh, Jose created Elixir because he wanted a palatable Lisp. I don't know if that's true. I'd like to ask him that if that's true, because that's cool if it is. Um, both have dynamic typing. Both can do some level of code reloading. We've got eval on both sides, DSLs. The things where we start to get stronger, I think, are we've got immutability and we've got concurrency, whereas they've got mutability and beach balls. <laughs> so what I want uh, for some foundational features, I want it to be programmable. Uh, I want it to be composable, like I want to be able to build small pieces and stick them together and just have them keep working. Uh, and that's something that seems to happen with Elixir code. And I want it to be introspectable. Like one of the really nice things about Emacs, if you're not familiar with it, is if you don't know how, what a key does, you can hit a little key chord. It'll tell you it calls this function. And you can say, what does that function do? It'll jump you to the source where that is. And then you can make a change there, save it, and go back. So I want that. Um, so. As I was saying, basic design, I want to, uh, the idea is to use Rust for really low-level stuff. Like, I'm not sure editing you know, several megabytes of strings where I'm inserting stuff here and there all over the place is going to be performant. If it's not, you know, backup plan is to drop down into Rust. Um, the back end of this thing is Elixir, and then there's a separation between back ends and front ends. So the back end kind of runs as a little server core, and I can connect to it from lots of different front ends. Um, <coughs> Architecture-wise, we have sessions. Session has multiple buffers. Uh, the idea there is a session can be shared or not. You and I could connect to the same session, see the same buffers. Uh, you may have a Vim-like key translation. I may have an Emacs-like one. Someone else may have Sublime-like. And within the same editor, same buffer, I can see you making changes. You can see me making changes. We're using our own environment configuration. Um, and then you kind of have just kind of the, the standard things of buffers and event maps and key maps and stuff like that. Um, so what I have so far is I've got sort of a basic supervisor and then front ends supervised and then the sessions, which is basically the core of the back end supervised. Um, it's just sort of a standard OTP tree there. Uh, and buffers, uh, the, uh, what I have so far is uh, a, a protocol for different implementations. And the idea is, well, right now I've got a string-based one and I have part of Elixir rope-based one, and I'll talk about ropes in a second. And then there are also Rust ropes, which I can drop down into if the Elixir ones prove not to be performant enough. Uh, buffers are 
you know, the, at the lowest level, the string buffer is just a struct, and it's got some things like, you know, a name, a file name, the point, which is the, called the, is the cursor, um, and then just the content. Um, right now, I wrap those in a session buffer, which is just wrapping it as an agent. So the protocol works against that agent, or the agent calls into that protocol, sorry. And I just use a simple update function, so I can have those different implementations on the back there, and just through the agent update function, through that protocol, I can abstract that out. So now I have this simple abstraction of just insert characters, delete characters, move around, and I isolated my methods on the front end from kind of my implementation there on the back end. Uh, this, this is an example of, like, for uh, you've got things like forward char, backward char, forward delete char, backward delete char. That's what happens when you hit, you know, right arrow, left arrow, backspace, control D, or uh, X in VI. Um, these are just, so that session buffer update is just doing an agent update against the agent call, which calls into the agent to change the data internally. Um, event maps are stateless. Uh, they can be coded data. And that allows for easy code reloading, so I can like make ch changes to them, pull them up, make changes to them, pull them up. Uh, some things that were really nice about Elixir is it made it really easy to do key code parsing. So this slash E A thing there is what an escape, or what an up character, when it comes out of your keyboard, it actually sends you Two key, uh, two couple of characters, which you have to interpret and then turn into is that a backspace or not? Pattern matching made it really easy, and also uh, really easy to go the other direction as well. So, and I was able to make this kind of recursive match thing. So, what happens, for example, in a high-speed terminal is I don't get these characters one at a time. It says maybe I get one, maybe I get thirty. So I then need to quickly parse out the escape characters. And I fought this uh, with this for an hour or two, and I gave up. And then five seconds later, I said, I wonder if pattern matching will help. And I went back and tried it again, and like 30 seconds later, the whole thing was working. Maybe, maybe two minutes, but. Um, so I mentioned ropes. Uh, ropes are, especially for an immutable language like uh, Elixir, a uh, really good data structure for representing things like large pieces or large pieces of text that you might want to edit. And it's basically a binary tree over a string, and it's balanceable. So you can have a long string, it might be a single node, and you want to insert a character in the middle. Uh, if you're doing this in C and you'd allocated that whole buffer, you would have to put a character there and move all the other characters over, or people would use a thing called a gap buffer where you've actually got some space in the middle of the buffer, and that kind of helps you insert and delete, but then every once in a while you kind of have to do these large memory copying operations. Um, using binary trees, you can kind of avoid that approach, or uh, avoid those pitfalls. So the methods that you can, or sorry, the, um, Protocol for rope is uh, kind of what you would expect for a string. You can index, you can concat, you can split, insert, delete, and report, which is like tell me what a piece of this substring is. Um, I didn't really want to implement this because it actually looked kind of complicated, so I was hoping somebody would have created one, and it turns out somebody did. Uh, they stopped working on it four years ago, so it worked with Elixir 1.0. It was still using records. It was using uh, dicks and hash, ma or hash maps. And so I updated it to 151, and I've pushed that. So that's available now if anyone else like, has a need for that. Um, and I did a PR, and whoever Copenhagen is on GitHub, um, I did a PR. I just sent it out like earlier today. Uh, if you would like it, and we can push it to XPM, I'd appreciate that. If not, I'm happy to take it over. Um, and then as I mentioned, there are Rust ropes as well. There's, a, there's an editor project uh, on the Google code GitHub called Kai, or I think it's Chi is how they pronounce it, but um, uh, they're, they're building an editor completely in Rust. So it's kind of a similar project. They're going to do Rust for everything, and I'm going to borrow pieces of that. Uh, and the idea there is to use the uh, Rustler resource, uh, use the resource object uh, features of Rustler to tie that rope into, into my project. I haven't gotten that far. That was some of the ambition that I didn't quite reach. So in terms of front ends, you know, I talked about having this kind of editor core back end. Um, this allows us to have multiple front ends. So we can have a terminal um, through the TTYSL port, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we can do WX, because WX Windows is provided uh, by OTP. Um, we can do Electron. Um, kind of kidding, kind of not. If you want to help me add that, I think that would be cool. I'm probably not going to spend time on it anytime soon. And then uh, Boyd Moultrie did a presentation on this project called XUI this morning, and I'm already talking to him about it. because um, there could be some cool synergy there. And you know, this whole thing about like Atom Electron is scary. It's kind of all this code. It's all these layers. Uh, I learned the other day just by kind of bouncing around the OTP code that it's actually pretty big. It is uh, 500,000 lines of C code 
and 2.4 million lines of airline code, which stunned me. I had no idea. Well, I had an idea that projects could be that big, but for what it seemed was there behind it, I thought it was this kind of tight, cohesive set of libraries, but there's actually lots of code there. Um, so we use this big thing every day, and it is rock solid. So maybe that's a reason not to be scared of things like that. Uh, the front end protocol for speaking to the back end is uh, kind of what you'd expect. It uh, connects to the back end, receives a session, it sends input events, and then it receives output events, and it displays them. And if that sounds familiar, uh, it's uh, for a reason, because it's basically kind of its agent, agent setup. Now, the first thing I tried, uh, you know, I looked around, some people had built a couple of simple games and whatnot using terminals, and so I tried this uh, approach uh, through eScript where Normally, when you start up the Erlang VM, it owns the terminal. It gives you that little shell. And there's a way to turn that off. Um, and you can kind of, you can, the things I found, like, had little ways of wrapping it in bash and shell scripts. The easiest way is to just do an e script. And so you, when you do this, you can pass different arguments into the uh, Erlang uh, machine. And right here, we're saying no input, ANSI enabled true. And I, I gave it some stuff hoping that I would be able to connect to it. I wasn't actually able to remote shell into an eScript running Erlang VM. If someone can help me figure out how to do that, I'd appreciate that. Um, uh, so, so basically, through the mix ES, you kind of set this up. Um, and then you create a simple little gin server. And the important thing here is that since you've, told those, you've, since you've told Erlang not to grab the terminal, you can now grab it. So you can open up a port. And there's a sort of magic incantation, TTYSL. This means turn off canonical mode and uh, turn off echoing. Uh, canonical mode uh, is uh, buffering, basically. So you want it to send you a key every time you hit something, and you want it to not echo, because you want to decide when they press that key, do I want to go up, or do I want to insert something, or do something else. Um, and I register with the front end, and kind of just return. So there's those flags that you can pass in. No input tells it not to read the input. Uh, no shell tells it not to ta start the Erlang shell. And then you basically have a gen server where you'll just you'll start getting data back from the port, and you can d decide what you want to do with it at that point. Um, once you've set that stuff up, it's just a simple mix script build, and then you might, it'll create a little binary there, which has wrapped up all of all of your code uh, with the uh, it'll allow you to run it just through this little shell script. Um, so now I've, I had a way to talk to the terminal, and so now I wanted to start uh, the terminals talk ANSI. ANSI is all these little codes which say make this text red, turn off the red, make it bold. Don't make it bold anymore. Uh, move the cursor up, move the cursor down, stuff like that. Uh, Elixir had io.ansi. I was like, oh, this is cool. I went in there, and really all it has is the coloring stuff, because I think what they support is what you need for uh, IEX, for the most part, and for like uh, the, the help command and stuff like that. Um, so I had to go and implement all of the, so this is where you get into the act shaving. OK, I, I'm going to draw the screen now. Oh, I don't have cursor move commands. So I had to go off and create this little library and add all these cursor down commands and like spend time reading through the ANSI spec on Wikipedia. Um, what, what time does this end, by the way? Just a time check. So like we're 20 minutes in, so I got 25 minutes? Sound right? OK. Um, but uh, there are some issues with this. Um, and so I mentioned, like, I was trying to get a remote shell working, is when you're running stuff, when I, I've told it not to start a shell, and I'm having issues, I don't want to debug, I want to run commands, I would have to go through this, what used to be, in a normal Elixir project, edit some code, hit reload, edit some code, hit reload, and you know, not have to stop the VM and hit control, you know, hit up arrow, hit backspace, and just kind of go like the, the loop got bigger and that got frustrating. So I was trying to figure out how to connect to it with a remote shell. I couldn't. Um, so my progress was slowed down by that because when I when I when I when I'm coding and I reach these little friction points, I I, I start wanting to do something else. It frustrates me. So I was trying to get the remote shell working. It wasn't. So I was like, okay, I, I want a terminal. What are some other ways I can get a terminal? Um, so I thought, maybe we can do a port. Uh, that's kind of what you're doing already. Um, so I didn't look over that. So I said, OK, IEX is doing this. Like, what is IEX doing? Uh, IEX actually replaces the Erlang shell. Um, it calls dash user elixir IEX CLI. And it says, uh, instead of running your shell, run mine instead. And you can implement that. And I, I looked at all the code that was available, or how much code it would take to do that. As I was like, maybe I'll do that at some point. I don't want to do that next. Um, and there's a great explanation of sort of how the Erlang shell works here that I will just summarize really quickly because I, I do think it's interesting. Um, so there was an old shell, and basically you had like a simple shell process. Uh, you would send commands to it, and it would eval them and kind of send it back. So it's kind of pretty simple REPL, except it's not a REPL. It's having to compile code and do stuff on the back end. Um, 
they have updated that and created a new shell. And this is a, this is a tree of processes. The, uh, user, there's a TTUI process, that's the TTUI SL thing that I mentioned earlier that sits off to the side, and that's what's owning the terminal, and it's sending stuff to the user driver. And your shell is actually one of these, at the bottom here, shell ERL. Like when you, you're sitting on one of those when you're sitting on a, a shell at the command line. When you hit control G, and like start a new session, you know, pop over and like do a, a kind of separate thing, uh, you're on another shell here, so that's what it's doing. Um, and it, this has a concept of a, uh, if you're familiar in Unix, like when you, when you fork and you have like uh, parents and children of a process group owner, and that's where IO goes, or like where signals go, um, Erlang has a similar idea. So when this thing starts up, it actually says for TTY ownership, um, for everything under your group, your IO for anything in there is gonna be passed down to your group URL file. Um, so that's how these things kind of stay independent for each other. So when these things think they're running, writing to the terminal, they're actually sending messages which get kind of captured and, and redirected depending on like where they're running. And uh, the way that works is similar to Unix, when a new process spawns, it inherits whatever the, the session leader was for the one underneath it. Um, and these things all talk back and forth to each other through uh, something called an IO protocol, and that's documented in the Erlang docs, but it's, it's basically turning uh, put char, get char uh, into events. Um, but what this, what this allows is it allows for remote shells. So this is how node one talks to node two, is that user driver is, uh, is talking to a shell running on the other node. So I was like, okay, this is how things work. Could I just replace TTYSL? And I'll kind of get in there under the covers and it'll think it's talking to the terminal, but it'll be really talking to some code that I write. Um, and I consider this approach and I may still do it at some point, but I haven't done that yet. And so then I thought, uh, what if I run our backend as a port driver? So a similar sort of thing, except instead of TTYSL over a simple port, I do a port driver. Uh, I'm starting to get into, okay, I'm gonna have to write some C code or some Rust code, right? Can I do something simpler? And I was like thinking around, okay, what can I do? Well, then I thought, oh, I can maybe, I can use a PTY. Um, that's terrible English. Will can start Erlang with a PTY. So it thinks it owns the terminal. Um, <coughs> Uh, so what I'm saying here is that uh, I will have a process. So Erlang will start first. I'll start my process. My process will create a PTY and start Erlang and make Erlang think that my PTY, which I'm going to own one end of, and the other end is Erlang. That's my ownership. And I don't know if, if you remember this guy, but uh, th this, is, this is what a, when you get a terminal, like when you get an X term or a terminal, it's emulating one of these machines, which is when you used to sit down at a computer and it was talking through some wires to a mainframe, you were sitting at a physical terminal. And that has been abstracted out now, so we have all, lots of little terminals. And you can fake it with something called a PTY, and that basically says there's a master end, which mimics the physical side of things, and then there's a slave end, which is uh, talking to the program. Uh, let's get away from that. Oh, sorry. Uh, but, uh, Where's it going here? Um, but it doesn't have to be a program here. It could be a program on another node. It could be over the network. Like there are examples of how you can connect to machines using SSH. So I thought, I don't want to write an SSH program uh, adapter, but when I do something like simple like Telnet, which stands for Teletype Network, and it's basically terminal over network, and it's super simple to, to pop open. So you can just say Telnet and a port, and if I have that port running, uh, maybe I can just talk terminal characters over this thing and it'll work. And it turns out that, that works really well. Um, so that's what I did. Uh, it's pretty easy to get a, a Telnet server going uh, in the Erlang virtual machine um, or in Elixir. You, uh, there's a project called Ranch, which is by the same guys that do Cowboy. I guess you take a bunch of cowboys and you put them together and it's on a ranch. So that's <laughs> why so I guess they have this project called Ranch. Uh, and it basically, uh, it sets up a, a gen server that uh, accepts connections and spins out little, uh, spins out protocol handlers basically. So for this connection, I have a gen server that's gonna spin out, um, which lets you basically receive data and send data over this Telnet connection. I just have some examples here of uh, like w what you need to go through because it'd be a, since it's Telnet emulating a terminal, there's some Telnet control codes that also go back and forth, so you have to filter those out so that your, your stuff doesn't get confused. Um, so, uh, if you have Telnet on your machine, uh, we can try connecting if you'd like. Um, let me demo. How do I pop? So I want to mirror screens if I want to live code. Is that the deal? Does anybody know? Oh, 
fight some back. Oh, it's over there. Command F1. Command function F1 for me. Thank you. Cool. Uh, can you guys see that? Maybe I can make it bigger. So probably what I should have shown, uh, what I wanted to show earlier was the, the Emacs thing that I ran. So I, this is just running it through the simple e-script. So I've got this crappy little editor here. It actually doesn't do much yet. That's, that's about all it does. Um, but I'm rendering, I'm typing characters, they're not echoing, and they're kind of going through my whole system here. Um, so we can also do that through Telnet. So let me just fire that up. Figure out what my IP is. Uh, does somebody have Telnet? Want to try this? 10, 10, 6, 29. Um, I might, I think I need to turn off the firewall stuff for it. I'm not going to turn off all the firewall. Let's see, uh, where would that be? This one here. Which one would this one be? It's probably one of these guys. Oh, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot of these guys. So many. You know what? I could probably just delete these ones. Delete that one. Delete those guys. You know what? I'll just do that. And okay. Let's go restart that. It should have asked me if I wanted to allow, right? Oh. Can you hit that? Are you able to turn it to that? I'll do it here and show you, but if anyone wants to connect 10, 10, 6, 2, 9, I think it should work. Uh, it's port 5555. Yeah. It's a Hollywood phone number. I've got the same dummy little thing running here. And it's like it's not good at resizing the screen yet, so let me do that. Kill that. Try again. Anyway, that's running over time. Were, were you able to connect? No? All right. I should have anticipated that. All right, oh we'll, we'll move along here. Um command function of one again. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, did my keynote die? Let's see. Where'd it go? Where's my mouse? Where's my mouse? Come on, mouse. What's that? Ah, uh, that's smart. Um, OK, so I've got it running just kind of through eScript. I've got it running through Telnet. Um, Next thing uh, you can, that I wanted to do is kind of do some uh, WX uh, front end stuff. Um, if you want to do cross platform GUI stuff, your, your options are kind of limited, and but they fall into kind of two basic uh, groups. One are ones that they look the same everywhere, and they just kind of do their own rendering, and it allows you to get a really consistent interface. Um, but that frustrates a lot of users. So they just they don't like it when they're on Windows and it looks like Mac or Mac looks like Windows, etc. Um, the other way to do it is to uh, use the native widgets, but you end up with this kind of lowest common denominator approach. Um, so it's a trade-off. Um, I don't want to write three or four or five or ten different kind of front ends for every single platform, so I'm just trying to get WX working. And uh, WX actually is in Erlang. Um, and I can demo it real quickly here. What was this? Command function F1, you said? 
So I don't know if people have seen this, but if we just drop into this. Well, you, you guys have all seen the observer. Sorry, start. Um, if you haven't, this is a really useful tool for doing debugging, but this is basically written in WX Windows, um, which is, I think, why it's probably in OTP. But um, you can go in and you can find the source code inside the OTP base and kind of get ideas for how to implement things. So we've got this. The other, the other one in here that is worth looking at is a WX Demo. And where'd it go? So this, this is actually just a demo application of all the different uh, WX Windows stuff you can do. So we've got dialogues, frames, gauges. Uh, you can do OpenGL. So all this is running through, through Erlang. Um, grids, whatever. So those are two things worth looking at if you just kind of want to get an idea for what this machine can do or what this uh, you can do through Erlang with WX Windows. Um, um, uh, using it is, uh, it's, it's, you're now talking to an object-oriented framework, so you kind of have to start thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, you can call WX new, WX frame, WX show, and each of these, like you can't, you can't chain these things together. They're, they're returning like true, false, like whatever. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to wrap in a functional language. Like we, when you, when you want to do like pipelines and stuff, it's really difficult, or it's different. It doesn't work that way. Um, the arguments tend to be in the wrong order because it's object-oriented. Um, but this is an example of just kind of how you put those things together. Um, they have a behavior called WX object, which uh, lets you run something that's like a gen server, but it's not a gen server. You can't put it, uh, you can't supervise it. It doesn't work well um, that way. And it, it, that lets you start up some code that was running inside the WX Windows environment, and you'll just start getting events, and you can react to those events. There'll be things like menu press, button pressed, you know, et cetera. Um, when you're using it from Elixir, you have to do some stuff to wrap the constants um, because you need to get these Erlang constants into Elixir. Um, so the way to do that is uh, in your source file, you can create this uh, HRL file uh, and you can create these little Erlang methods that wrap it. And this is basically doing a binding between Elixir and Erlang. Um, but all this is tedious. So I wrote a library to make this easier. Um, and then when I was almost done with it, I got really excited because I found this post where Joe Armstrong was Saying to on one of the windows or one of the Elixir lists, hey, we've got all this stuff inside, uh, all this WX stuff inside uh, Erlang. So much of read a library that wraps it. And I was like, wow, that's what I just did. So that's cool. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I have this, and I, I I just made it uh, public today. But I created a library called WX Widgets, which uh, uses a code wrapping technique and some helpers for the records and all the constant stuff, so that it's it's much less tedious to write WX Windows applications. And I'm in the process of doing this, but I'm not done adapting it to Elixir idioms. So it, it's very much a point zero 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 one. And if you want to use it, like you're you're going to be fighting with things, uh, but maybe you can help me. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's still kind of basic. Like the arguments are in the wrong order. I, like we want to set it up so that we can just create a frame and like call a whole bunch of methods on it. Okay. Um, and also. Uh, it needs some docs, so all the docs are pretty empty, and so you have to sit here with WX Windows open here, and uh, your 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 uh, generated help docs over here, and you kind of have to bounce and forth between all these windows. And I just want to find a way to collate it all into one place. Um, so it works through uh, code wrapping. So I basically uh, I wrote some parsing code, which goes and gets the struct XML uh, documents out of the Erlang, uh, which is what is used, I think, to generate the help files. So I actually parse those using a parser combinator library called Combine. Um, which was pretty useful. And I create these, uh, I just create like simply wrapped things, which is called directly, you know, cache best size calls directly in. Um, and then I wrap that in a simple using macro, and then I can kind of pull it into uh, Elixir. And it allows, and then on top of that, I created a, um, a gen, or a, a thing like gen server in Elixir where it kind of wraps the uh, gen server code. I created something called WX object, which wraps that and kind of sets up the context for you and like sets up your event handlers and all that kind of stuff. So it makes it much easier. So this code here that looked very uh, Erlangy, and if you're an Elixir coder, like maybe is a little frightening, uh, now looks a little bit more um, Elixir-like, which is, which feels better for me. And I also wrapped all the constants. So there's, you used to have to go and like find these constants one at a time and kind of copy them to, into this HRL file. I, I went and grabbed all like six thousand of them or something. It's like six megabytes of like wrapped code. Uh, but you can call it really simple, and you can use the name of the actual atom like very simply. Um, I created a thing called a WX object server which will wrap a WX object and turn it into a gen server like thing and allow you to put it in a supervision tree. Um, I don't, like your mileage may vary. I don't know if it's a good idea to have these things supervised and going up and down, up and down. Like this probably hasn't been tested a lot. So it gets a prototype, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, and just to kind of show you 
what I have going there. Oops, no, nope, I wanted and it was this one. And so this is this is you know starting up in the same code environment. It's it's very simple here. Like this one isn't actually handling keystrokes or doing anything like that, but this is using this this wrapped library that it created. That was an awesome demo. <laughs> uh, let me see. I think I'm almost done here. Oh, actually, we're wrapping up, and I'm just kind of on to like kind of what I learned. Um, so you can learn from my mistakes. You don't have to make the same ones. Um, one of the mistakes I made was like I was like, okay, I want to parse all these files, and I started doing it with regular expressions, and I got nastier and nastier and nastier, and I was pulling my hair out, and I said, you know, I should just like find a way to parse this. You know, and there's leaks and yak, and I was like. Like those things are big and kind of scary to use, and so I didn't want to get into that. But I found like a simple parser combinator library, uh, which is basically regular expressions which are composable, and there isn't a separate scanner or lexer, or lexer and analyzer. It's kind of all in one. You say like get a word, get a bunch of words, make that a statement, get a bunch of statements, get a paragraph. Um, so I should have realized I was clearly using the wrong tool for the job after like two or three days, which I did, but it took me two or three days. So don't do that. Um, and I was using a, 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 a project called Combine, and Combine is great. I think it's written by Bitwalker, um, but it doesn't have laziness. So if you want, if like, and I was trying to parse Erlang terms, which can include other Erlang terms. So I quickly got into an infinite loop. Um, there's a you, you can wrap it uh, in a thunk basically, and this works most of the time. I still got into infinite loops, and I kind of haven't sorted that out. But this is enough. This is enough to let me parse. Uh, in a recursive manner, uh, a lot of a different airline code. Uh, the other thing is you should not name your top level module WX. I don't know why this doesn't work, but it was really confusing because it seems like it totally should have worked and I spent hours and hours on this until I, I was like, why are some projects working, some aren't, and then it like, just took me a while to like, you know, split that up, figure out what was going on there. So uh, the code I used on this project, the WX widgets, is up on my uh, repo. Um, the Elixir rope library that I wrapped is also available. Um, mine's a fork. I did a pull request. Like, we'll see if this four-year-old um, repo wants to keep up with it. If not, I'll probably take it over. And then the code for my editor, uh, I haven't released that yet. I'm going to do a bit more work on it so it, like, it's not a crappy editor. It's at least like I can, w once I can use it to edit itself, that's probably when I'll push it out. Um, but thank you.